We're fighting it out in Iowa. God bless the great state of Iowa. We're picking up people every day in Iowa. Welcome to Iowa. It's a test of endurance. I know you're from here, but please don't tell me it's not cold. It was so cold. This is cold, okay? <laughs> Under like any human condition. And a battle of wits. I am here to announce that I am officially Oh, I would much rather have Sarah Palin than Glenn Beck. In a fight to change the course of history. So you guys ready to make a political revolution? Yeah! Iowa has a history of surprises. You have done what the cynics said we couldn't do. But we've never seen a race quite like this. Twitter. <laughs> Clown. Yeah. Uh, I have an ample supply of underwear. <laughs> It is no surprise uh, that the establishment is in full panic mode. We're on the road in Iowa, following the candidates, tracking the money, and meeting the people who decide. I understand that this could turn a little rocket. Why do the people of Iowa go first, and why do they do it like this? If you can write T-R-U-M-P, you have just caucus for Donald Trump. We'll show you how it works, how the race is playing out, and the forecast for Monday night. This is Money, Power, and Politics. Hello, I'm Craig Patrick here at the Fox Election Center in Des Moines, and our first guest is former Governor Jeb Bush. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Okay, so you look at the ads right now playing on Iowa airwaves. A lot of attack ads. A lot of them between Marco Rubio and Right to Rise and you. Politics first. That's the Rubio way. He's been missing votes for a long time. Doesn't show up for work, but wants a promotion. He threatened to vote against and then voted for it. He supported his own Dream Act, and then he abandoned it. One of these days, young Marco's gonna flip, flop, flip on you. When you look at those ads, and you think of what you've said about Marco Rubio in the past. I have a special place in my heart for him. I just, it's hard to describe. You were very close. Yeah. Um, you cried tears of joy for him. My wife has told me, don't, don't cry. Don't cry. But Marco Rubio makes me cry for joy. Do you still cry tears of joy for Marco Rubio? <laughs> what do you mean by that? This is, uh, we're running for President of the United States. This isn't beanbag. Um, everybody's record will be scrutinized. My campaign is about why I should be the nominee to beat Hillary Clinton, because I have a proven record, as you know, as governor of Florida, where I did a lot of big things. And um, he'll get scrutinized if he wins the nomination by Hillary Clinton in the Clinton hit machine far more than whatever Right to Rise is doing. And he's attacking me and attacking two other candidates as well. So that's, that's called politics. As we watch the returns come in on Monday night, based on your strategy, where do you expect to be strongest? Uh, I expect to, to do well, beat expectations and continue to, to work hard in these first four states in February. But this is a long haul. I mean, we're on every ballot, and uh, my expectation is this is going to go a long way. We have so many good pe people running that uh, it kind of divides the field a bit. And walk us through your strategy in the closing hours here in Iowa. Just make sure that the people that have committed uh, with all the door knocking and, and uh, phone calling that, that we get them out to the caucuses. Remember, it's a 7 o'clock in the evening on a Monday night. Iowa's not the, you know, it's not Florida in February, and people have to go and they have to spend an hour. So you have to train them, get them ready to go, uh, make sure you have speakers at every caucus, and we're, we're well organized in that regard. This, these last efforts are all about that. Governor Bush, thank you for your time. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Florida Senator Marco Rubio is also crisscrossing the state, and from what I have seen, he also appears to be dominating the Iowa airwaves. Given all of the attack ads, so many of them from Right to Rise and Team Jeb, how would you describe your relationship with Governor Bush on a personal level, and to what extent are the attack ads hurting you in the polls? Well, look, there's been $30 million of establishment money spent attacking me, and that's fine. It's politics. We'll fight through it. We feel good about our chances here in Iowa. I'm, Jeb is my friend. He'll always be. Um, obviously, I mean, his campaign has decided they're going to take everybody down if they're not going to win, and that's they have a right to spend their money on anything they want. But for us, it doesn't really matter. We're going to continue to move forward. We feel really good about it. And finally, what are your expectations for Iowa? We want to do very well, and we're going to we're, we're just working hard every day to get as many votes as possible. We feel real positive about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. 
We've also lined up interviews with most of the other candidates in the Republican race here at the Fox election headquarters, and we will bring them to you through our special coverage through Tuesday. Meanwhile, the latest 538 forecast model gives a slight edge in the Republican race to Donald Trump. Coming up, we also have a new forecast in the Democratic race. It's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. Well, in the Democratic race, the 538 forecast model still heavily favors Hillary Clinton, giving her heading into this weekend around a 75% chance of winning the Iowa caucuses. But Bernie Sanders certainly has momentum. Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders have a lot in common. They voted together 93% of the time when they served in the Senate. But for months, they pressed very different themes. She's always stood strong to get the job done. Hillary Clinton has stressed experience in government and persistence. I will get up every single day and do whatever it takes to make sure our country is safe and strong. Bernie Sanders says he's running to rock the system. He understands that the system is rigged and he's the only one who can bring real change. And it is rigged. People are sick and tired of establishment politics and they want real change. And with that, he surged in the polls, taking a big lead in New Hampshire and gaining ground in Iowa. And if we do well in both of those states, I think, my friends, we are looking at one of the great political upsets in the modern history of the United States of America. He could be right, though Clinton holds a big lead in the states that come after Iowa and New Hampshire, Sanders could get a bounce. Remember, the polls in other states aren't static. They often move based on results of the first two contests. And Hillary Clinton knows this, which is why she is now stressing her resilience. That it's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. As Sanders drilled in on income inequality, Hillary Clinton adjusted to stress the same points. To make the wealthy pay their fair share. As Sanders ran up the lead in New Hampshire, Clinton moved staff and resources to Iowa. Her strategy is to bear down on winning here, then hoping that will give her a bump in New Hampshire. Please welcome President Bill Clinton. Former President Bill Clinton jumped back in the spotlight and is now stumping for Hillary Clinton all across the state. And Clinton latched on to President Obama, making the case that she's the right choice to build on his legacy. President Obama wants to make universal background checks the law of the land. I'm not going to let the Republicans rip up Obamacare and throw it away. I'm with him. Sanders has drawn bigger crowds, and he's doing much better with younger voters, particularly college students. But he's facing a disadvantage in Iowa that could cost him. Under the caucus rules, the number of delegates are limited by precinct, no matter how many people turn out. The population of Iowa is concentrated in the east, and Sanders' support is strongest in college communities in the eastern half. That's Davenport, Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, and Des Moines. Those clusters of support for Sanders may be washed out by a smaller turnout from rural precincts in the West. So when you watch the returns on Monday night, pay close attention to which counties are reporting. Now the winners of Iowa don't always win the nomination, so Evan Axelbank shows us how it's played out in the past. Depending on your party, the Iowa caucuses are a tale of two sides. Winning there has either meant everything or nothing. At one time, these two men thought they were on the fast track to winning the nomination. You have taken the first step of taking back this country. And in 2008, this was Mike Huckabee making a bold prediction after a resounding win. And I think she'll be a wonderful first lady for the United States of America. But for them, victory was fleeting. In 2012, eventual nominee Mitt Romney, who finished second in Iowa, trounced the field in New Hampshire. In 2008, John McCain, a fourth place, also ran in Iowa, was nearly unstoppable after that. Thank you. To Republicans, Iowa is nice to have, but New Hampshire, where Republican voters are less religious, has slowed down the likes of Huckabee and Santorum. But Iowa has sent a very different signal for Democrats. Look at this trio. Obama, Kerry, Gore, the winners of the last three caucuses and the last three nominees of the Democratic Party. If Bernie Sanders were to win it in 2016, that might not necessarily be predictive of Sanders winning the nomination. The thinking is that Hillary Clinton will do better in South Carolina, Florida, and New York. Uh, winning Iowa only gives the, can the, the winner about a 50% chance of winning uh, overall. Reporting for Money, Power, and Politics, I'm Evan Axelbank.
But the state does narrow the field, and that's why Iowa gains a lot of clout and attention by going first. Coming up, see how chaos launched Iowa to the front of the pack, how Florida tried and failed to change the order, and why Floridians may not believe how a caucus really works. focusing on the important topics of the evening. Ted Cruz was leading in Iowa and running up to score until Donald Trump raised questions about Cruz's Canadian birth and then Iowa's governor hammered Cruz for opposing ethanol subsidies. I believe that would be a big mistake for Iowa to support him. Cruz opposed the standard, which require us to blend corn-based ethanol into our fuel supply. It helps the corn farmers in Iowa, but Cruz says it drives up our gas prices. The Washington cartel lives on cronyism. It lives on making deals. To that end, Cruz also opposes price supports on sugar, and that supports 12,000 jobs in Florida. So the battle over propping up farmers will shift from Iowa to Florida, and Rubio, who supports price supports on sugar, is already snapping at Cruz. It's a loan program, and it basically allows our sugar industry to compete with other countries that are heavily subsidized by their home countries, particularly Brazil. This battle in Iowa sets up a showdown in Florida. So before we arrived in Iowa, we traveled through Florida to show you what's at stake. The Florida Candy Factory in Clearwater runs on sugar. Well, sugar is our business. They boil it in kettles. Pour it in slabs. Spin it with flavor, press it, cut it, and ship it all over the world as peppermint sticks and taffy. One of the biggest things that were, is a challenge to us is the cost of sugar. Congress drives up the cost by fixing the price of sugar and guaranteeing profits for the growers. Well, it's bad for consumers, obviously. And candy makers say it's also driving jobs outside the country. And these machines are sitting idle. The Florida Candy Factory had 25 employees. Now it's down to seven. As you've noticed, as you've walked the plant, the lack of machinery and machinery operators making saltwater taffy. The owners say they cannot compete with big factories and other countries that can get cheaper sugar. The small business is the one that tends to hurt. Congress came close to changing the sugar policy, but the sugarcane farmers in South Florida convinced them to keep it the way it is. Politics is a big part of what I do. And that produces five tons. Rick Roth grows around 2,700 acres of sugar cane in the Florida Everglades. He says our government sugar program keeps farmers in business, keeps prices stable, and pays off for consumers in the long run. The bottom line really is, do you want your food to be produced in this country? Growers say if Congress drops those price supports on sugar, prices would drop at first, then other countries like Mexico and Brazil, which prop up their sugar growers, would swoop in and drive our farmers out of business. And we think that would lead to OPEC-type prices in the future. We'll see how the debate over corn subsidies figures into the results in Iowa on Monday night, but it will not be settled the way we do it in Florida. Coming up, we'll show you how Iowa won the right to be first, how a caucus plays out, and why Floridians may not get it. Do you know what a caucus is? Charlie Belcher will help us sort it all out. Okay, while I'm here in Iowa, Charlie Belcher is joining us from Tampa Bay. And uh, Charlie, got your finger to your, can, can, you, uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, that's right, oh, Craig. Well, that's right. Just, just keep going. Are we, are we just, pretending just, this is live? Yeah, 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 I, I don't even have an earpiece in, but I, just, I thought if you just, wanted to just, pretend. Just, just, I don't, just keep going. Yeah, yeah, just, just keep going. Probably, no, I should just go ahead. Okay, I'll just, I'll just go ahead. Uh, it, 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 Craig sent me out to, to find out what do people really think about Iowa going first in this whole election process? So what's a caucus anyway? So I came to the St. Pete Clearwater Airport, International Airport, to find a flight to Des Moines. Iowa because I figured that was the best place to find a real live Iowan. You're an Iowan, you're, you're the expert. What is a caucus? Well, it's to get the people. Uh, 
can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Cause I'm, well, it's not a quick question. I had an idea about that first part. <laughs> because it's, I'm trying to understand this whole Iowa caucus thing. Mm -hmm. you, can you explain it to me? <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal in Iowa. Because if you've never been to one, it's nothing like you imagine. So what do you think about the Iowa caucuses coming up? Why do they get to go first? I mean, somebody has to go first, I guess, but why not? We could all just vote on the same day. One big federal primary, right? I mean, it just seems, uh, it seems a little old-fashioned. Do you know what a caucus is? That, even that word confuses some people. I'm asking people about the Iowa caucuses. What, I, I, I know nothing about it. Don't worry, neither do most of us. Will you be voting in the caucus? Yes. You go to certain uh, precincts that, uh, put, uh, and then you there's a bunch of people, and then you put in a piece of paper and you vote who you want to vote for. If I'm an I I I Iowan, am I automatically a part of a caucus, or I got to go somehow join the caucus? No, you you have to be. Uh, support some particular candidate and then when the caucuses are held well then you have to go to the specific site so how do you decide who wins the caucus then Wh whichever meeting group had the most people mm -hmm. yes I'm finally catching on to this one day when you grow up you'll be able to vote in a caucus it's not every day you meet an Iowan no. that you can actually ask these that, caucus questions right that, that's true so I, I came over here and I'm talking to him to learn about the strange thing that they do in Iowa as an Iowan are you proud of the fact that you guys get to go first and have so much influence over the rest of the country um yes I would say that we're proud of it and we own it I don't care what Iowa says I'm still gonna vote my own way but it does sway people doesn't it Yes, it does. What do you think of the state of politics today? Yeah, I, w I wish it was a little quieter. Well, I think you've summed this all up perfectly. Well, if I've learned anything about this process, I've learned that what happens in Iowa does not stay in Iowa. It does have an impact on the entire election process. Like it or not, that's the way it works. For now. For now. Back to you, Craig. All right, thank you, Charlie. You know, Iowa did not always go first, but it got lucky nearly 50 years ago and never looked back. Iowa gained inflated power in choosing our presidents by chance. It all started in 1968 with riots and chaos. The 68 Democratic Convention was such a mess that party bosses sought order and, among other things, required states to advertise primary or caucus dates well in advance. Well, since Iowa had a four-part selection process, it had to start earlier to meet the notice requirements, making it first. It made the 72 race more interesting and launched Jimmy Carter in 1976. I didn't have any political organization, not much money, nobody knew who I was. He set the gold standard for retail politics in Iowa and gained a big shot of momentum. Up and down the streets, factory shift lines, barber shops, beauty parlors, restaurants, shaking hands. And we've got about 5% of the Democrats and Carter is wiping them out. With that, Democrats and Republicans in Iowa realized the importance of being first, joined forces, and passed a law requiring Iowa to always be first, to serve as the nation's focus group, in effect representing a diverse economy and people. I grew up castrating hogs on an Iowa farm. Even though when it's largely farmland where pigs outnumber people more than six to one. So when I get to Washington, I'll know how to cut pork. And it's mostly white people, 92% according to the census. Well, Florida, being far more diverse, tried to change the pecking order. This moves Florida up in the picking of the next leader of the free world. It puts us in a place where we should have been before. So now we can ensure that 18 million Floridians will actually have their primary vote matter. But nine years ago, it triggered a chain of leapfrog among the early states. The party bosses took Iowa and New Hampshire's side and punished Florida by yanking delegates. This is a disaster. So Florida decided to drop back to March this year and let Iowa screen the candidates for us. And you may be surprised by how they do this on caucus night. It is quite different from the way we vote in Florida. Pink people come here, greens come over here. The Iowa caucus can be confusing and stressful. I understand that this could turn a little raucous. Historically, voting in Florida has been much easier, except for the six-hour lines and rigged election maps and glitchy machines. I st still feel that I've been duped. Missing ballot boxes, hanging chads, lawsuits, and butterfly ballots that trick Democrats into voting for Pat Buchanan. It says, I voted, I think. But enough about us, now back to Iowa. 
In Iowa, you don't vote for a party nominee, you caucus. That means you have to show up for a neighborhood meeting by 7 p.m. or get locked out of the cold. 6.59, let's get off the board. I gotta make the point. If you're not here by 7 o'clock, you won't get in. If you do get in, you have to stand around for a while, then Republicans scribble names and draw them out of a hat. If you can write T-R-U-M-P, you have just caucus for Donald Trump. And when we say draw them out of a hat, we mean that literally. Mike Huckabee. Democrats make it a little more complicated. You, you come talk to us, and that's the offer we have. They to break into groups based on which candidates they like. Then at this time, you need to move to your preference group. Then the leader uses a formula to figure out which groups have enough people to be considered legitimate. If you are not into ranks of 10, you need to get into it. Some groups are then told they're not viable in front of everybody. <laughs> And those groups deemed unviable are then subjected to peer pressure to join other, more successful groups. Come and join our group. Yeah. Yes. And then the groups deemed unviable literally walk away from the candidate they wanted to somebody else. And that's how they make decisions that wipe out most of the field long before they ever make it to Florida. We're staying in Iowa through Tuesday and we'll bring you live results on Monday night as they come in. So we are still a long way from finished on behalf of our political team here in Iowa and in Florida. Thank you for watching.